Good evening, everyone. My name is Vinka de Boulam, and I'm the chair of the Department of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania Stuart Weissman School of Design. Tonight, we're delighted to host our colleagues at the Department of Architecture, Mirka Brooks and Daniel Markovic, for their lecture primary, pre preliminary plans. This semester, Mirka and Daniel are both teaching our 602 studio, a second year studio in our MR program where we bring the practice into the design studio and work with external experts and engineers. Uh, their practice informs the students in the best possible way, I should say. Mirka's studio, titled Playscapes, posits that architecture can transcend any specific program and its duration and can establish spatial and tectonic orders that lead to the invention of new programs during the life of a building. Daniel's studio is titled Decadence and Degradation, and it will design a bathhouse in Philadelphia's Fairmont Park while engaging with concepts of the picturesque, as well as the relationship between cultural excess and formal erosion. Mirka and Daniel co-founded Forma in 2018, and their work combines architectural clarity with conceptual rigor and aims for the challenging combination of order and whimsy. I quote, design wanted. There is an architecture that is grandiose and exuberant. There is an architecture that is minimal and discreet. And then there is an architecture that clarifies and delights with the perfect combination of reality, wonder, playfulness, and innovation, and that is formal. Mirka and Daniel are both licensed architects and received their Master of Architecture from the Yale uh, Architecture School where they were awarded individually in subsequent years the William Worth Winchester Traveling Fellowship, the school's most prestigious award. Prior to Forma, they, they both left quite impressive jobs. Mirka worked as the project designer at Eisenman Architects, leading the design development of the Yenekapi Archaeological Museum in Istanbul. And Mirka, Mirka has always has also been the faculty, and I think still is, at the Yale School of Architecture since 2014. Daniel uh, is a founding member and editor of Project, a journal for architecture published since 2012, and previously worked as an associate architect at Diller's Covidion Renfro, and most notably as the lead designer of the renovation for MoMA's uh, expansion in New York City. I didn't know that, Daniel. That was great to read. Please join me in welcoming Mirka and Daniel uh, for their lecture tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minka, for this generous introduction and for, for having us here. We are super, super excited, but I'll leave it to Daniel, who is uh, basically leading off our lecture uh, here. I'll kick us off. Yeah, but um, yeah, thank you so much. We're both very excited. I'm going to um, share the screen here, but both very excited to have this opportunity to share a little bit of our work uh, and also our um, story with you. I'm trying to just make it, oh, there we go, full screen. Um, and we thought we would start with that. We're gonna go through a few projects, obviously, um, institutional as well as residential, and then, and then end on um, <clears throat> something that we're focused on right now. But before we do that, we thought we'd give a little bit of our backgrounds, which which Winka helped us out with in the introduction. Uh, but I'll highlight again super quickly. Um, we met in uh, grad school, uh, as she as she mentioned. We had a sort of uh, set of shared experiences, both with uh, folks that we studied with, uh, but also our kind of general interest in architecture, and then sort of went our separate ways gaining different uh, professional experiences, but, but keeping in touch. Uh, and ultimately sort of started to come back together and do some collective work uh, and, and, and form ultimately uh, started somewhere around 2018, as, as Winka mentioned. Um, but in terms of our approach, we like to say, I think uh, we come, Mirka and I, from slightly different uh, backgrounds and perspectives. She was born in Slovakia, I, I was born here in the United States, but I think that we bring slightly different attitudes also to the practice, which helps balance it and, and complements it in, in certain ways. And one um, maybe little anecdote to describe that, we had a interview that, that asked us what our, what our different approaches were in the practice. And we somewhat jokingly said uh, that Mirka expects 
to design a school on a as yet to be developed colony on Mars. Whereas I am, uh, I expect to finish the whatever project we have at the at the moment, which is to say that I uh, perhaps come from a more grounded and maybe slightly less optimistic uh, perspective. And and Mirka uh, has uh, lofty aspirations and and certainly brings that that level of optimism. But I think that that also um, not only comes out in sort of our general approach to the practice, but also in the way that the two of us, I think, engage it specifically in the work and how we how we approach the project. So I think she's going to mention a bit a bit about that. So um, in, in the spirit of our lecture title, the kind of preliminary plans, uh, this was our very first project that Daniel and I worked on together. We were actually both uh, teaching the 501 studios here at Weizmann at the time. And it was a competition for a children library in Colodi, Italy. And I think it somewhat kind of foreshadowed our following methodology and the kind of recurring search for this balance between rigor and whimsy that, that Winkel already mentioned. Um, but with each project, we typically try to establish a kind of clear organizational strategy and overall order, which usually happens through the plan drawings while also look for moments of kind of agitation, which sometimes come through spatial and geometric disturbances and other times might come from like context and site constraints. So um, as many of our students here um, at Whiteman already know, and Daniel, I think you'll have to flip the page for me. <laughs> Thanks. So as many of our students here at Whiteman already know, uh, we do like to work with plan drawings. So for us, the plan is still one of those kind of fundamental architectural media that allows us to think through the ideas in kind of clear, comprehensive, and rigorous way. But the plan for us is never a two-dimensional artifact. It is always kind of tied to the three-dimensional space and ideas of how people occupy space. And then concurrently, we start working with kind of realistic images quite early on in the process. And I think both Daniel and I are yeah, kind of like interested in realism and see it as kind of crucial in our work. So many times we call these images sketches. They really allow us to kind of um, develop a parallel set of explorations. So while the drawings really enforce a certain degree of kind of abstraction into our process, uh, the images many times um, kind of offer immersive explorations into materiality, atmosphere, and really like specific ways of inhabiting space. So we will show a total of eight projects grouped somewhat thematically and programmatically. And we will end with a project that we have not shared with anyone publicly yet, um, which we, we really, you know, it has really occupied the kind of energy and thinking uh, uh, for us in the past few, few months. But, um, so this first project uh, we will briefly show is our very first client-based project, uh, which we completed a little over a year ago in New Haven, Connecticut uh, on Yale University campus. Uh, the client was a Yale broadcasting company, uh, more specifically the board of directors, which really included multiple individuals. So this was a really kind of informative experience for us from, from the kind of client relation perspective as well. Uh, since there was a whole group of decision makers. But as you can see here, if Daniel can pan a little bit uh, around where the building is, um, uh, it's, it's kind of a small property that was basically wedged between much larger development uh, on Broadway Avenue that the client basically purchased in 2019. So the main task was to convert the kind of three upper stories of the residential units hidden behind this beautiful brick facade from 1930s actually into recording spaces and meeting areas for the student radio station called WYBCX. And there was an existing restaurant at the ground level, which we couldn't touch. So the only access to the construction site was this kind of single door on the left, followed by a narrow staircase and kind of right in front of a busy bus stop. But the majority of the renovation focused within the kind of interior of the building. With, with slight alterations to the bus stop, if anybody noticed quickly. Um, but this was the kind of broadcasting space in the following slide uh, that the students used previously. It was kind of a fun, messy, windowless room 
So part of our job was really to first document the size, the location, and use of all the kind of equipment uh, that needed to be then relocated to, to their new location on Broadway Avenue. The new um, kind of purchase building was quite old. Um, and these are just some of the images of the entry, the circulation space, and the fourth, fourth floor studio, which were kind of comprised really the bulk of the renovation. Um, and really navigating the code transition from residential to commercial was a bit of a challenge. And sometimes, you know, really every inch matters as it relates to uh, issues of egress. But the building section um, is, is quite simple and shows three floors of the radio station sitting on top of the existing restaurant, which are connected by the staircase facing the kind of main public street on the right side of the drawing. Uh, the budget was extremely tight. Uh, so we ended up using color blocking as a kind of economical yet impactful strategy to create identity and really provide space definition within the project. So here you can see the guardrail, which we conceived as a kind of simple continuous element and the black color unifies it visually with the existing stairs, while it also kind of differentiates it from, from the surrounding walls. The simple section detail shows how the guardrail is really built like a solid wall and it was really just slotted between the existing stairs and the landing. Um, it is interesting to note, um, that in renovation projects with constrained budgets, often the space of the staircase cannot be fully reconfigured. So the guardrail really becomes the only element where a more adventurous design agency can be kind of exercised. So we recently completed another renovation project in Denver, Colorado, a residential uh, renovation, where the kind of continuous guardrail snakes around the existing staircase. And we were super excited by getting this thin continuous black shadow line traveling through, you know, along the edge. So sometimes the smallest things can make you really happy. Um, but just a few more images of the rest of the spaces. Here at the top of the staircase, the space becomes almost like a dark color portal through which one passes into the recording space. And then where one actually steps, you know, into the fourth floor, it's a kind of bright multifunctional zone where on the left, the bright color blocks kind of delineates the more active performance space where they would have live bands. And then on uh, the kind of more stationary space of the broadcasting is enveloped in this kind of cool gray. Uh, these are just a couple of uh, detail images of the windows, which had to be fully replaced, kind of fire, uh, fire rated new windows, and then the color scene. Uh, the plan was very simple. Um, just basically we gutted everything out and opened it up to connect across from the front of the building to the back. And then the last image, uh, the view from the kind of performance space towards the broadcasting zone. And if you squint or look, Daniel is there in the background, probably about to broadcast Metallica to Yale undergraduate students. <laughs> Sorry, Daniel. Okay, so the next uh, two projects are both competitions. Uh, which we subsequently kind of set up as, as a series of investigations in the office and which we actually each used uh, for framing our current 602 studios uh, here at, at the Whiting School that Wink had just mentioned. So I will talk about uh, the kind of preschool project, which is really the, what the studio that I, my studio is based on, and then Daniel will kind of walk you through um, uh, a bathhouse project, a competition, which he's using for his studio. So uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, although it started quite unintentionally, um, we have been increasingly interested in this relationship between, between rigor and whimsy or between kind of rigidity and order on one side and looseness and disorder on the other side and how, how they can actually coexist together in a project. And like, unlike the previous project I talked about, which had a kind of highly constrained urban site, uh, this competition asked for like a design of a peaceful located in a rural area on the southern side of Mozambique. So the first question for us was, what is the local context that can kind of help us situate the project? And then the second one was, how does the building create its own context since you can you can see on the previous slide, the area is kind of sparsely populated with minimal infrastructure, <laughs> infrastructure sorry. So uh, Mozambique has a kind of tropical climate with 
two seasons, a wet season from October to March and the dry season from April to September. So we wanted to kind of build upon the collective knowledge reflected in the local architecture, which utilizes a series of these kind of tectonic um, techniques, such as the permeable screens you can see in the middle, the masonry walls and elevated roofs, all of which have been developed over time in response in response to local climate and really kind of material availability. And on the left side, of the, uh, you can kind of see the site during the wet season, kind of super lush um, um, landscape. And then we were also interested in developing a kind of looser relationship between the building and the landscape, something that may be more random and even playful in its organization. And so this lithograph by Michael Heiser was a strong influence during our design process. And we really liked how some of the more clearly defined figures sat loosely within the kind of random field of lines and, and color patches. So our proposal uh, was to create a courtyard building, the following so slide, um, that, that would be nested within the kind of sloping site and a series of scattered playgrounds, pathways, and kind of short retaining walls which would respond to the kind of topographic changes within the landscape. So um, many of the gathering spaces, and you can see it better on the following slide, um, would be organized around these kind of existing trees on the property. And the idea was that since children often learn about their environment through play, um, these exterior classrooms would kind of encourage children to learn about the flora, and the kind of various aspects of local agriculture, which you know, is one of the kind of primary sources of income uh, in the area. So uh, rather than create a kind of single building, the preschool, um, and let's see, it plays, the preschool would be housed within a cluster of nine smaller volumes that are kind of organized around a unifying square uh, courtyard and each room would be entered from within that courtyard to kind of in, encourage interaction between the students and the, and the teachers and produce a sense of kind of community. And then the passages between the rooms would allow kind of more fluid connection and circulation throughout between the courtyard and the landscape. Um, so this is basically like as zooming out, you can kind of see the almost confetti-like arrangement of the various playground pieces throughout. Um, the model, which is on the following slide here, actually shows the preschool without the roof, but you can see how the four gabled roofs that would be above would also kind of register through color and marking kind of the primary entries into the courtyard. So again, the kind of coexistence of a simple shape, such as a square, um, um, kind of, uh, you know, existing within the same project as the kind of looser pile of the, of the roofs above. And then the section, I mean, uh, the tectonic strategy was quite simple, a corrugated metal roof supported by open web steel joists sitting on top of kind of stabilized earth brick walls. So the large overhangs that you can see on the right would actually protect the interiors during the heavy rains and the open joists together with the kind of permeable screens would allow air to circulate throughout. And then lastly, there is a kind of the exterior view as one might see the building sitting within the landscape with the kind of playful, more playful uh, roofs um, rotating you know, within, within the kind of center. Um, Lastly, we didn't mention it at the beginning, but we do love making physical models, uh, even though we, we haven't really done it lately as we've been kind of fully remote for, for a few months. Uh, but this was a super fun project, which we made a large physical model of in the office and we're kind of testing different roof uh, structures and strategies of how the landscape you know, could be subdivided. So uh, this is really just a kind of really overview of like hundreds of images that we've taken throughout the process uh, uh, to get a few of the final photographs. But now Daniel will actually explain the next competition project. Yeah, th this was another competition as, as Mirka mentioned, but of a completely different program and site. Uh, obviously it was located in 
uh, Bratislava. And it is, again, as Mirka mentioned, is a, is a bathhouse. It also had a library component to it. Um, the other thing about this project, which was different than other projects, that it, certainly the previous one, but others we've worked on, that it had a very charged uh, existing condition. Um, and that was something we were actually excited about working on. Uh, the competition organizers specified certain areas that were to be kept or preserved. Um, but we liked that challenge of working in a uh, historic uh, space uh, and trying to build off of it and enhance it in, in various ways. And the couple things, oh, I should say also that the, the building was used as a bathhouse previously, although not in the recent past. And so they're looking to up, they were looking to upgrade it and also um, introduce that library program that I mentioned. But the, the three aspects of the project that we kind of quickly became most interested in, one, as I mentioned, the sort of historic quality and um, uh, playing into that, hopefully in interesting ways on the right. And then on the left, just the, the diversity of experiences and programs that a bathhouse offers or suggests. Um, I think that the, the program has uh, appeared across many uh, cultures and, and history, but also even within a single bathhouse, there can be a whole series of spaces uh, and experiences that are quite different from hot and cold water, uh, steam, uh, uh, running water, color, texture, spaces of gathering um, in, in large groups or small groups, as well as more maybe contemplative spaces uh, for, for individuals. So we wanted to really play up uh, that diversity of spaces within the, within the project. And then the way that we began to hopefully try and unify that was through essentially a, a square, which we'll show a little bit in, in plan. So this was actually the existing plan. And I'm gonna flip a little bit back and forth between this, our proposed um, plan and the, and the previous plan. Uh, but you can see that many of the larger scale um, old bath spaces were to be kept um, and and we wanted to engage with that uh, but we used the square uh, specifically as a way to organize uh, the circulation and create a unity across a series of spaces so um, opening up the walls in very select moments to create that very clear circulation loop and then pairing that with a material, um, uh, a material intervention that that worked to also further unify uh, the space. Um, zooming into the, the plan just a little bit, um, again, that we wanted to introduce a series of smaller uh, individual spaces that bordered spaces of, of gathering within the plan. Uh, but as Mirka mentioned in the beginning, we like working in plan, not only to think about uh, layouts, but the precise shape of space uh, entry, exit, uh, and, and also represent the, the feeling of, of some of the diversity of the spaces uh, through the drawing. So um, also trying to um, kind of reference some of the existing characters like these um, octagonal pools that were existing, allowing that to sort of bleed out into the exterior spaces to the right and a little bit the cafe uh, to, the, to the north. In terms of the material, uh, in, in that we used or, or began to think about in the spaces that we were doing, let's say a little bit more work, uh, we wanted to still reference some of the existing qualities uh, and, and one of the, the tiles essentially that was used in the original bath house, but, but try and twist it in a very kind of subtle, uh, subtle way in, in its orientation that produces a, a set of patterns that you can see on the right, but also through slight color variation. So, from the same pattern producing 10 different slightly um, colored or discolored tiles to allow us to deploy gradients of color uh, within the space. But we wanted to use especially the blue and this color um, to unify the space and, and looking at how that begins to look in the, in the views. This is the entry hall space immediately as you kind of move beyond the changing room. So having uh, in this space a kind of complete immersion with that, with that blue tile, but using the gradients to um, demonstrate the location of the pool uh, around, um, around this space. And carrying that tile, although it didn't exist in this, which was uh, one of the historic spaces that we worked within, but, but maintained uh, the, the sort of arched pilasters that uh, border the space and carrying that even into the spaces where we did, again, less, less work or we proposed less uh, intervention, 
using the tile at the floor uh, to unify uh, materially uh, each of the spaces. I think the section begins to show a little bit our interest in the diversity of uh, spaces that we wanted to produce, um, both through form, access to light above, uh, using vegetation and um, uh, some of the historic uh, aspects, like I mentioned the, um, the pilasters in, in this vaulted space. This is an old boiler that we uh, opened up a wall and, and exposed as part of uh, another function. But looking at some of the images of, of those spaces quickly, um, using simple forms and, and deploying that material and simple um, introductions of light and entry, even in, let's say, both, and I would call this and, and the following side, uh, sort of grotto-like spaces, but, then, but spaces that just by the variation in the height and the form produce a very different um, feeling or atmosphere uh, within, within the pool. Other, other um, rooms that we sort of worked on uh, capitalized on the existing, large existing skylights, allowing vegetation to grow. Um, this was a, was a more um, experiential space that we, you know, we became very interested in the caustics that are produced uh, through water. So, you know, with a very shallow reflecting pool skylight, it became, uh, became the experience of this, of this room. And then contrasting materials uh, rock, which is both highly finished and then uh, highly unfinished, I would say. And just one note, I think that we certainly cared more about the library or the bath part, a component of the project, which is maybe one of the reasons we didn't, we weren't successful. But one aspect of the library, which we definitely wanted to include, uh, was opening up those two very different programs uh, that were were kind of active right next to one another through very simple but clear um, uh, portals between the between the programs. We'll shift gears here a little bit and and start to look more at the kind of the residential work. Uh, so this is I'll show a couple and, and Mitka will as well. Uh, this was a competition actually one of our very early projects, not the first, but um, maybe the second. Uh, and it was a competition uh, for a house, a, a dream house, in fact. Um, and when we first looked at the brief for the project, we found it kind of funny that the, the organizers seemed to be suggesting or encouraging that we pick some sort of exotic site. Um, Tony Stark's Malibu home, some, some uh, space in Greece, uh, the waterfalls at, at falling water, um, and and then somehow that the, the choice of the site and the landscape would would just produce uh, a quality dream house. Uh, so of course our reaction to that was to to try and pick kind of the most mundane site that we could think of and see if we could still meet with maybe successful uh, results. So we picked not only a, something you know you could call it mundane. I'm not sure I would, but the uh, also something that we're familiar with. So this was a uh, basically a townhouse lot uh, in Brooklyn, but we still wanted to play into that idea of landscape that seemed to be implicitly uh, encouraged in the in the brief. So we thought um, in urban environments, especially in in New York City and Brooklyn, sort of access to green space, access to vegetation is is something in high demand. So we thought, uh, and in this project, maybe more than others kind of began more with the section. Uh, I think more typically we maybe start and plan, but um, what we wanted to do was, was basically draw that, um, the green, the, the vegetation and the landscape directly into the, into the project and up through the center of it. Um, and so you can see in the section, uh, we've kind of excavated the garden level uh, of, the, of the townhouse and then carved out uh, a large sort of atrium space in the, in the center. And the couple things to note about the section, there was an idea about a, a gradient of vegetation. So we kind of moved from the, the most damp, dark, uh, mossy, which might actually grow in a lot of um, Brooklyn townhome basements uh, at the bottom, and then moving up to a kind of more uh, eventually arid, almost desert-like condition at the roof. Um, and the other aspect we in the section that was important to us is the simple organization of the circulation that would lead you into the more public spaces of the project. So from the garden level into the living and kitchen, 
up to an office parlor and then ultimately the roof deck and the the living spaces the bedrooms were were located at opposite ends on on opposite floors and accessible by um, bridge elements which you can see perhaps a little bit more clearly in the in the plan so the stair kind of led you to the public spaces and then the the bedrooms were somewhat um, somewhat more uh, private uh, and accessible off the, off the bridges. Another aspect of this that we kind of want to, and this plays a little bit into the maybe order and, and whimsy or rigor and whimsy, but um, you know, being somewhat constrained in the townhouse uh, lot, we felt like there was an opportunity for a little bit of, of formal uh, exuberance or, or play, uh, probably most notably at the roofscape. And we also like the fact that this sort of complemented the, the section where the energy of the vegetation sort of comes up through the center and almost explodes out the top. Um, maybe explodes a bit too violent for, for what we were really going for. But I think that the fun of the top level was something that we wanted to play with uh, in, in, in the form of it. And we used a series of um, kind of similar modules that, that, and I think that there's even just two modules in here um, that when rotated combined produced a whole variation of, of conditions uh, in that essentially greenhouse space on the, on the roof. And then just flipping through some of the images, you can see sort of the bit of fun poking out the top um, and, the, and the excavated garden level uh, at, the, at the lower level against, set against the very consistent um, townhouse facade uh, that kind of lines the, lines the street. And then moving up through the project at the garden level, accessing that stair into the living spaces that are framed by that sort of central um, green excavation and section. And ultimately to the roof uh, space that um, uh, essentially garden space uh, up, up above, greenhouse space up above. The next uh, project that I'll quickly run through before flipping it back over to Mirka. Um, it was ultimately a competition, although it was something that we were working on beforehand. Uh, we found it productive not to kind of wait for briefs to come our way that we're interested in, but uh, to essentially design the problem ourselves. So we began, uh, became interested in a series of essentially coastal beachfront properties and to develop strategies uh, that would work uh, in those conditions. Um, this was uh, it located in um, uh, Palm Springs, it, it just uh, north of Miami. And the things that we were interested in that, I think were twofold. One is being a, a kind of beachfront property or coastal condition, the issue of um, uh, rising sea levels and, and coastal erosion, basically the, the building's relationship to the ground being somewhat tenuous was one aspect that we wanted to think about or engage with. And the other aspect was the kind of communal or, or maybe even uh, almost party uh, atmosphere uh, of, a, of a home, uh, of a beach home, so that it might not be something that even one individual or family um, owns and lives in year round, but something that's shared and is more about um, uh, people coming together than it is about um, uh, kind of continuous living. And so what we ultimately ended up developing uh, was a strategy that that worked kind of towards both of those ends. And one of the aspects of, of beach homes that we were looking at that, that seemed fairly important was sort of deck spaces that would open up to the water and to the, into the views of the water. And early on in, in testing out different ideas, uh, we started to move that deck uh, up to the up to the roof line. And that did uh, a, a number of things for us. One, maximizing the, the space of that, of that deck and that kind of all important uh, space for gathering. Uh, but maybe also more importantly, it freed up the bottom edge of the, of the building, of the massing, to have a, a different and, and hopefully more interesting relationship with the ground. So knowing that uh, that, that tenuous relationship uh, with the ground is, is something to be considered on, um, in these locations, that was uh, it's something that we gravitated towards and something that also worked, we'll show in the images um, sectionally. So the play with the volumes that hang below that roof line was also something that 
migrated into the plan in, in, in modest moves that with sectional changes within the, within the spaces. In terms of the plan, uh, uh, fairly straightforward, but I think that we, we liked to work um, in that series of modules uh, and have a sort of very clear uh, approach to how the, the, the building is used and accessed. So a central stair volume connects the whole uh, house together from the ground, first floor, second floor, and up to the roof space. The bedroom volumes uh, on the left uh, all share a bathroom and a shared uh, deck and face the kind of more urban side of the site. And then the uh, living spaces opening up the kitchen, uh, living, dining towards the, uh, towards the views. On the second floor, uh, another uh, kind of alternating set of bedrooms. And then we use that space to create uh, larger scale spaces and also hide a small um, plunge pool within the, within the section. But looking at some of the views, I think the things that we were most interested in, in terms of the exterior were, was maintaining the clarity of the volumes, the, the sort of crispness of the massing from the outside. And obviously uh, houses require light uh, and air and, and access to the outside. So we developed a strategy where um, just a simple uh, screen system, operable screen system that would allow for that access um, uh, in, in all of the spaces, but when closed, kind of, again, maintained uh, the, the kind of purity or crispness in the massing that we were, uh, I think, kind of most interested in. And then just quickly flipping through some other uh, of the interior spaces, this, that central space of the stair that connects all of the levels. And then into the, uh, the kitchen living spaces. And here you can see it, how we use the section uh, to hide uh, a very small um, little plunge pool uh, up at the deck, the deck above. And then um, just the, the, the slight sectional change that the kind of play of volumes allowed, allowed us to separate um, you know, the, the, some of the seating areas from, from the dining areas, et cetera, and distinguish them in, uh, in, in a kind of modest manner. And then the payoff hopefully is the, is the expansive and open uh, deck and where kind of access to views um, are uh, un, uh, uninhibited. So um, similar to the previous project that Daniel just, just talked about, this was another of the series of elevated houses we've been working on. Um, it, it, it's a house for a group of individuals with similar interests and values rather than perhaps a more typical family residence um, that, that is kind of lived in year around. So both of these were kind of conceived within uh, within that kind of uh, overarching umbrella. But the project was developed in collaboration with our friend and colleague, Mark Geddes, um, and it is located on Fire Island, so not that far away from New York City. So the local area has an amazing history, which we don't really have time to get into, but some of the architecture is very much reflective of the kind of unique culture of the place. So among others, um, Horace Gifford, uh, who was um, an architect, and if you want to flip yet to the next, thank you, um, has kind of built a series of beach houses during the 60s and 70s in the area, which were of particular interest as they dealt with like ideas of symmetry, privacy, and, and kind of monumentality within a domestic setting and in very compelling ways. So for example, the oversized windows, um, the kind of producing almost a cathedral-like ceiling uh, or feeling within relatively small bedrooms or, or a kind of seemingly impregnable surfaces of the vertical wood siding juxtaposed with kind of expansive glass walls oriented towards the ocean, which you can see a little bit on the top of the right photograph. But perhaps what is the kind of most unique feature of, of the site and the town is the boardwalk, which acts really as a public street connecting the private residences. So there are no um, actual roads. And often it is elevated above the ground and surrounded kind of by lush vegetation. So, so in a way, the nature runs like already uninterrupted throughout the site. Um, because the lot sizes in this area 
are kind of long and narrow. Um, the water exposure is limited, while the less desirable exposure to, to one's neighbors is maximized. So what we really kind of wanted to do is to circumvent that issue by creating a series of these internal exposure with the natural environment and somewhat like stretch the house along the axis, so to speak. Um, so the elevated boardwalk would become the kind of connecting path throughout the house, linking all the spaces together. So rather than kind of packing all the house functions into a single volume, the sleeping, the bathing, the living, and the pool lounging are pulled apart and interspersed with like open air gardens. So this way, every space in the house has two faces oriented each towards like a different garden. Uh, which kind of maximized the connection to the exterior. The second floor uh, really just kind of shows the two sets of um, separate bedroom and bathroom suites. So the total of four. Um, the elevation, uh, the kind of rectangular form is again like elevated above the ground. So similar to the previous house, but, uh, but it's more like a barcode alternating between the kind of solid and semi-open surfaces of vertical wood siding and the kind of wood slots. So while this provides privacy from the neighbors, it also allows kind of air and partial sunshine to enter into the interior of the house. Um, a side view of the house, uh, obviously missing all the neighbors around, uh, but it kind of shows the relationship to, to the ocean. Um, and then uh, um, the next view shows the kind of, if you can just flip through it, yeah, thank you. Um, really the, the hanging courtyard, uh, which one would basically encounter upon entering, entering the house. And you can see actually the four bedrooms uh, in front of you. This is kind of deeper into the house. So you're basically progressing through that main access uh, into the ocean. Um, and then uh, a series of the kind of living quarters. So the one on the left, which is the lower bedroom, and then a double height story living room uh, looking towards the, uh, towards the bedrooms as well. And then lastly, the kind of last, the, the pool lounging space would fully open uh, into the kind of exterior view of the ocean. So, the, the view from the beach looking kind of towards the house, um, really, you know, the, the house acts almost like a prolonged portal through which one enters back into the communal kind of living spaces. Um, so I'll just quickly jump to um, really the next project. Uh, and it's really, these are the two last projects we will show. They are both located in upstate New York. Uh, uh, the first project opened up kind of a series of investigations into communal living um, within a rural setting um, and, and brought up interesting questions of kind of scale within residential architecture. And in a way, it, it pushed us to do the second project, the last one we will show, uh, which has kind of more expanded, you know, our scope into development and, and investing. So last summer we were approached by a potential client, actually two families that were interested in building a shared set of homes on a kind of beautiful property in Dutchess County. And so the site is kind of sprinkled with sculptural pieces of within various landscape settings, such as the one on the upper left, uh, which is kind of placed on top of this hill overlooking this beautiful expansive landscape, um, or the one on the right, which is kind of nested within tall trees. So, we thought we needed to create kind of a bold and clear architectural gesture that could balance the scale of the landscape, the tall trees, the long stone walls, and the contemporary art. So um, Michael Heiser once said, scale is a proportion and it is imagined. Size is measurable. 40 feet isn't large, although putting it inside a building, it may be, end of the quote. So with this in mind, the proposed buildings may seem large as a house, but at the scale of the architecture in relationship to surrounding forests, they are not. Um, so similar to the Mozambique project, uh, we were looking for kind of strategies of how the building can create its own context while also kind of respond to the immediate surroundings. 
So each study proposed a clear organizational strategy, a kind of a square, a line, and a circle. And within each, we combined three typological elements. So a barn house structure, which is the one on the black, a stone wall, so there are, those are the kind of thinner lines, and then an open meadow, which are the kind of light gray areas within each diagram. And all three were approximately the same square footage and included kind of living areas for the two families and shared communal indoor and outdoor spaces. So what we were really testing were ideas of kind of domestic proximity, since the clients were really interested in a variety of scenarios and were not they were not yet sure when we were talking to them if they would like to have like two separate houses or potentially kind of more connected ensemble. So uh, the line was the kind of most connected, uh, housing all the functions within a kind of single volume, which would be inscribed by a circular meadow. And then the two dwelling uh, units would be basically located at, the each, at each end. And a kind of two-sidedness of the house would be produced by the location of communal decks and kind of stone walls at the back of the house, while the front of the house would be kept quite austere. So um, the next slide shows the, basically the, the kind of elevation, the austere elevation as one would approach the house. While at the back of the house, uh, with one of the kind of communal decks, would be carving a, a kind of exterior room. So again, like the, the kind of two-sidedness would be produced by this, by this kind of carving approach. Um, there is one more view of the zoomed out facade with a pool. And so similar to the Mozambique project, and, and in a way uh, kind of similar to the radio station project, which we showed with the color blocking, the change of material produces a kind of more graphic uh, effect on the back facade, delineating basically negative volumes of space. Uh, the more zoomed out, sorry, the courtyard, the kind of um, uh, second scheme would really frame an exterior center while placing the two houses diagonally opposite each other, uh, yep, right there. And then the communal area was located in the upper left of the plan while the garages of each house would be located basically in the remaining corner. So each of these interior spaces would be kind of linked by an exterior covered room where the landscape would actually, again, run throughout. And the strategy is somewhat similar to the Fire Island house, uh, kind of just scaled up and, and wrapped around the square. So it's basically kind of alteration between an interior and exterior space. Um, the, the view, the exterior view basically just shows one of the houses on the left and then the garage on the right and then connected with that exterior kind of room space. And then um, there is a kind of view of the central courtyard. And then lastly, uh, the third scheme, the cluster was the kind of most dispersed strategy. So this really provided the kind of most privacy between the two families while still preserving a kind of sense of community and connectedness through circular kind of organization and also through like formal self resemblance of volumes. So that's actually clear to see in, uh, in the rendering and the following view, but basically the, the, this is the kind of entire ensemble and the simple gable form will be replicated at different sizes within the cluster. So uh, one of the houses would be a kind of double large barn with decks on each side. So you can see one on the right side and left. And then another house would be actually a single story aggregation of rooms uh, connected with like decks on either side. And so the kind of self-similar house forms would have kind of radically different interior organizations and, and, and even kind of connections to the landscape while being formally um, self-similar. Uh, so this is our last project we'll show. Um, we didn't ever end up getting the project that I just talked about, but, but the experience was really kind of incredibly productive for us. And in a, in a way really jumpstarted our development project, which this is really what it is. Uh, and this has really occupied our energy for the past, past few months. Uh, We've been playing with this idea for a while, but a few kind of near misses really pushed us ahead towards developing our own project. So here we are the client and the developer. 
and we are putting kind of our money, so to speak, on the line. So uh, all of these are basically kind of always hovering, you know, as constraints as, as we were starting to develop this. But um, just kind of walking you through the first initial process, the beginning of fall, more or less, uh, after after we didn't we didn't get the the previous project, uh, we started doing a lot of research into available properties, uh, more specifically like vacant land around Hudson Valley, just due to its proximity to to New York, and we drove around and visited probably fifty or sixty properties on on either side of of the river. So this is just a snapshot of a few of them. Some were super large, some were really small, some had kind of incredible steep and forested slopes, other had like open meadows, but with wetlands, um, some were in like really busy, busy roads uh, and larger electrical wiring running through them. But, but through this lengthy process, we really got a sense of what is what, what a good development property is. Um, and concurrently then we, we started kind of developing a financial strategy. So looking at kind of comparative properties, the sale of homes in the area, the sizes of the properties in relationship to the kind of quality and size of the homes and et cetera. So uh, you can kind of see this little tab down on, on, the, on the bottom. We, we also started to craft our own like pro forma, which is still being adjusted as we are waiting pricing as we speak. Uh, but the process has been incredibly informative, to, to say the least. Um, but um, having, uh, having said that. This is on Pumpkin Hollow Road. Uh, I think this is a, there's a shed with electric. There's these views, it's freaking cleared. Um, the road is quiet. It's in Hillsdale. Let's just build a house here. So, yeah, as you can tell, maybe from the video, when we first uh, went to the site. Uh, we were fairly excited uh, after the long search, but but also, I mean, primarily because it had all of the attributes that we were kind of looking for and excited uh, to build within. Yeah, you can see the excitement. <laughs> uh, but it, you know, it, it it was a gently sloped site that worked up to a hill. Ultimately, where we um, sited the house, a wooded area, quiet street, secluded. Uh, it had views out towards a a pond area to the to the east, um, and and was was partially cleared. Uh, you know, and with uh, you know, and kind of ready for us to 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 begin to design a house, and. That you know, maybe that process of looking through the land um, a, kind of forced us uh, or encouraged us to, to kind of start with the site, with the house. Um, you know, one of the things that we certainly wanted to maintain was um, again the, the kind of aspect of the views to the to the pond to the east, um, and and ultimately that led us to to basically build on the on the apex of that of that hill, which you can see. In this um, in this site plan, so we kind of began to know where we wanted to build, and even with certain orientations of uh, rooms, like the kind of kitchen wanting to look out east in the morning, and, and the living spaces having larger access to, to southern light. But we didn't, of course, know what we were going to build. And I think, like is typical for most of the projects we work on, at the beginning especially, uh, is sort of a, a lot of ideas that we begin to throw out. Uh, test in plan, um, uh, but then quickly move into into 3D, uh, use testing materials, forms, trying to um, uh, again capitalize on the on the aspects of the site that we were kind of most interested in. Um, I mean, this being our our current um, baby, uh, you know, I don't know if we overdid it in terms of the studies, but it certainly is something that that we do for all projects. So. Um, you know, going through that process of essentially brainstorming, uh, uncovering the things that we're most interested in, and then trying to edit out and weed everything else out that that isn't um, uh, doesn't fit into that into that logic. And maybe ultimately through that process of uh, testing out lots of uh, ideas and um, uh, scenarios, uh, you know, we see we found ourselves coming back to a few ideas that we were. Had, had sort of begun in other projects. Um, 
you know, one of which on the left, Mirka mentioned with the Mozambique school, uh, a kind of looseness in plan, a kind of scattering or almost confetti uh, that produces a little bit of that, that playfulness in the school, which is also present in a, 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 a landscape plan um, that is actually under construction for a client, uh, also in upstate New York. Um, just a simple series of decks that cascade uh, down from one end of their property and, and sort of border a pond. And then in the middle, uh, I think one of the kind of more three-dimensional aspects that we were also interested in sort of came out of the Miami project that I spoke about and, and was also present in um, this chapel uh, for, a pro for a project that we did in, in Rwanda. Um, but the, the thing that we found with that and, and, and other projects was not, I mean, we're interested in kind of playing with some of these uh, curved filleted volumes, uh, but the, the byproduct of, of simply the shadow on those spaces producing other curves became something that we were somewhat interested in. And then the last aspect uh, was from a, a project in, in Denver, which Mirka actually showed the, the staircase for, but an interest in kind of thresholds between the spaces of the house. Um, this had a series of vaulted, or we proposed a series of arch vaulted spaces uh, that that connected rooms, the kitchen, uh, to some of the living spaces. But that kind of definition of the threshold was something that we we kind of wanted to play out a little bit in in this project and in the plan. So this being the ground floor plan uh, of the project, kind of demonstrates a couple of those attributes that kind of I talked about on the previous slide. Uh, the other thing, I mean, maybe the first thing I would say also with the plan, it, we gravitated towards something relatively compact. And I think that was kind of for two reasons. One, uh, financial being it, that it were kind of on the hook for that. Uh, but the other, I think also being a familiarity with, with compact plans, having worked townhouses uh, in, in Brooklyn and worked in smaller spaces before, uh, we were very familiar with um, basically creating efficient, efficient spaces. Uh, but obviously this um, isn't in, uh, you know, Brooklyn, it doesn't have a party wall. And so we wanted to make sure that it opened up uh, to the landscape on all sides. So beginning to play with the landscape where the kind of looseness in plan of the decks and then a series of planters that um, kind of emanate out of the house was important. Uh, obviously all of the spaces, you know, wanting to, make, to, to capitalize or, or maximize the, uh, the views out to the, to the exterior. The other aspect of the plan, which is evident, is the sort of thresholds. Um, so the kitchen space, which looks out to the east over the pond, and the living space and the bedroom on the first floor uh, is defined by these pinches in plan, uh, which also have an effect on the exterior, allow for some covered space uh, as well as entry space uh, for, for the house. So those moves on the exterior kind of doing double and you'll see even triple duty, but uh, this producing that kind of threshold between spaces that we were um, fairly interested in. The second floor plan follows the first, not surprisingly, um, but, uh, you know, and organizes around the stair and a, a kind of central space, um, but trying to also allow some of those uh, cuts on the facade to bleed in and affect um, some of the shaping of the, of the walls on the interior. And then the the elevations were the opportunity and, and also in 3D uh, to begin to play with some of those attributes from the kind of Miami house and the Imigongo house that we uh, mentioned earlier. The siting uh, became fairly clear uh, in terms of the orientation, the kitchen, um, again, out to the east morning light, the large living space facing south. Uh, on top of the hill uh, with a kind of unobstructed access to Southern light and, and views in that direction. And ultimately for the, the kind of the facade and the kind of more three-dimensional carvings, you know, we wanted to play with the, the precise um, alignment with the decks and that sort of playful landscape um, uh, kind of scatter shot at the, at the ground level uh, and then try and um, you know, not just do kind of surface cuts that you might see or, or might be more typical on a house, but try and um, uh, cut kind of somewhat more deeply into the facade to create um, that shadowing effect that we were interested in, but also the pinching in plan uh, and, and the outdoor covered space that I 
uh, mentioned. The other thing about the carving of the exterior that um, you know we, we've been looking at materials, and I'll show uh, basically views of the house that we're that we're studying right now. Uh, but we wanted to use the materials uh, again to accentuate that those carving uh, moments on the house. So very simply with sort of kind of warmer uh, wood set against a kind of cooler standing seam metal uh, to bring to bring that out. This is the the north um, kind of entry facade and your sort of introduction to the house. And then moving to the to the other side that kind of moment I keep mentioning that fairly interested in, but the kind of play of shadow uh, on the building. And looking from the east out towards the other kind of set of very distant mountain views, uh, this view also shows our interest in, in the various deck spaces that we wanted to create. So um, one in the middle of the page, you can see um, bleeding right off of the living space in the center. And then in the foreground, the, a, a smaller deck that uh, sort of belongs to the kitchen, uh, which is here, which we'll look at. In terms of the interior spaces, we wanted to keep, um, especially the kitchen, kind of relatively um, muted so that the focus was on the orientation and, and the views. So kind of minimal color palette, um, uh, kind of a minimal shelving above, but still a layout that works uh, hopefully for somebody who purchased the house. And also, yeah, in this view, I mean, the kind of materiality, if we just go back one second, starts to relate a little bit more to the landscape. So like the kind of line of the stone, as you can see, kind of travels through and picks up in the horizon um, behind, uh, behind the window. So it's a kind of collapse of the foreground and the background, uh, which is quite interesting. And then in the, the main living space, obviously that kind of visual and access to the outside that is kind of all important. Um, trying to play into that a little bit by allowing the deck to feel as if it's actually coming into the space or the exterior is actually coming into that to that main living space through the uh, articulation of the floorboards at the at the ground, but also the ceiling uh, and a little bit that kind of color blocking that we've played with uh, before. Uh, the other aspect of this which we um, found from carving the facade was, was opening the windows on kind of three sides. So the, the room actually feels like it's being kind of pushed out uh, into the exterior when in fact it's in the center of the, of the plan and, and actually bordered by um, uh, other uh, areas of the, of the house. And then just kind of the overall view from the, from the south kind of showing how all of that uh, comes, comes together. But we're not uh, we're not uh, done with this project, obviously. Uh, but only <laughs> so we're this is where we are now. We've done some additional clearing. We have plenty of wood chips, um, uh, and as Mirka said, are kind of awaiting uh, pricing uh, before we hopefully start uh, construction on this in in a month or or so. Um, but that that brings us to the end of the the lecture. We're very happy and excited to um, have a discussion with you all, uh, answer questions, and um, uh, discuss further. Yeah, thanks for sticking around until the end. <laughs>